It's a funny thing, though. I mean, it's, it's a strange thing, let's say, that one of the things we already agreed on, as far as I can tell, is that the antidote to pathological dogmatism is, is free, truthful expression, something like that. Is, is that... Yeah, uh, okay. yeah. But well, but one of the things I would say that's absolutely crucial to Christianity in particular is the notion that the thing that's redeeming is exactly that, and it doesn't matter. So it's universal truth. Now, if we both agree on that, the idea that the free expression of truthful speech is the antidote, let's say, both to nihilism and to totalitarianism, then the notion that that might be embodied in something like the word, which is truly, I think, the deepest of Christian ideas, is that why is, how is that not the same claim? Now, let, let me elaborate it more, a little bit more, more, more completely. Mm -hmm. So here, here's the strange thing. First of all, I agree with you, by the way, about the danger of flying off the text, right? About as you move away from the text, your interpretation gets less and less constrained. And I think it's also the same danger as move, of moving away from the facts, which is, I think, why you want to ground values in facts. So I get that argument, and I think it's accurate, but... Here, but here's, here's something strange, is that this notion that, redemptive, that redemption is to be found in truthful speech is actually embodied in Christian mythology, let's say, as a personality and not as an idea. It's actually something that you embody and act out. It's not just an idea. And that's why there's an emphasis on the idea of the embodiment of the word in flesh. It's a very sophisticated idea. I mean, it's, just, it's an insanely sophisticated idea. So, and, okay, well, and, and there's I, one, one more thing. And, and, okay, so, look, you, you, you've made the case, and, and I hope we can really get to this, because this is the really tough part of our discussion, I think, is that you want to ground the world of values in something that's true. We could say objectively true, but let's just say true for a minute. And I share that desire, but, but the problem is, is that I can't see, and you actually state this in your book, I can't see how you can interpret the world of facts without an a priori interpretive structure. And, and this is an old philosophical claim, it's not unique to me, it's, it's the claim of Kant, for example, that you can't get directly from the fact to the value because there's an interpretive framework that mediates between you and the facts. And the, so first of all, I'd like to know if you accept that proposition. And then the second question would be, if you do accept the proposition, then what's your understanding of the nature of the interpretive framework? Because I think it's best understood, at least in part, as a personality, or as a story, for that matter. So, Well, I, I think our intuition of truth, the, the intuition that there's a difference between fact and fiction, or fact and fantasy, the intuition that we, are in, we live in relationship to a common reality about which our understanding can converge, pr provided we're looking in the same direction with the same tools, I think that is it's certainly deeper than religion. It's not best captured by stories. Uh, it's, it, even, if it, even if you could, as a matter of historical fact, point to its roots in story and myth and religion, that's not an argument that it's now, in the 21st century, best captured by story and myth and religion. Uh, I think it's, it is a fundamental intuition to which our sanity both personally and intersubjectively, is anchored. I mean, to lose a sense of objective reality is to lose the, the, the platform on which you can communicate oh, okay. with anyone and, or, or, or rationally expect anything to happen a moment from now. To, to, to think that your memory represents something about a prior state of the world and your beliefs represent something about a possible state in the future, all of this is anchored to a sense that there's a difference between knowing something really and just imagining it, right? There's a difference between perception and hallucination. All of these distinctions are born of this, this intuition. Um, I think we do have, clearly, we have fundamental intuitions which uh, are either impossible to analyze or can be analyzed with, res with respect to only other intuitions, which we, did, which we deem more rudimentary, uh, we upon which everything else we do as a matter of knowledge gathering and sense making is built. So the, um, the intuition that two plus two makes four. Minus one, that's three quick maths. Everyday man's on the block. 
smoke trees. 